So are we ready now? Yes, please. Good. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this, and I also wanted to point out that I'm doing this uh, not only as the medical director of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, but also um, uh, on behalf of the Inner Society uh, uh, Coordinating Committee that uh, Dr. Bob Wilden heads uh, at the NIH, and it actually was his idea to start this series of, uh, of uh, talks. Today I'm going to talk about understanding genetic tests and how they're used, and I'm doing this from the perspective of a clinical geneticist, which I was for 29 years at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, prior to uh, starting this job with the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And I just want to start and sort of just remind people that genes are made of DNA and they're carried on chromosomes. In the day, um, people used to say that every specialty had its organ and that genetics organ was the chromosome, but now uh, we've gotten into much more detail in chromosomes, and we'll talk about that. And can I go back to that? Number three, it sort of hopped. There you go. I just want to point out that genetic disorders are the result of alterations in genetic material, and as you can see in the picture, the types of changes can be a break of a chromosome or an extra piece of a chromosome, a change in a single base in a DNA code of a gene, or there could be expansions, and we'll talk about these. And the other thing is just because something is genetic does not mean it's inherited. There certainly are many genetic diseases where the gene change has happened spontaneously, uh, potentially in the course of um, prior to conception, or in the case of cancers, uh, it's something that's acquired during a person's lifespan. So today I'm going to talk about the types of genetic tests that are available, what the tests entail, what the different tests can detect, and then how to decide which test or tests That's are appropriate ridiculous. for a genetic uh, given clinical situation. Okay, let's go to number five. And we talk about genetic tests, we can talk about chromosome tests, which are called cytogenetic tests. We can talk about DNA tests, or sometimes called molecular tests. And then there are biochemical tests for various metabolic disorders. And we're only going to talk about cytogenetic and molecular tests today. Okay, where did it go? It is where ours is. It says meeting password. Excuse me? Um, the presentation has sort of yeah. more. What, what is the meeting password? Genetics. Okay. Should I pause here? Please. A minute, Dr. Flannery. Looks like somebody else took over the screen. Hmm. It's not responding. Yeah. I'm getting that fixed. Give me a minute. Okay. Should we maybe let Dr. Rosenberg know that we can see his messages? Yeah. Probably so. Alan, we can see your messages. I hear you, Claudia. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how or why that happened. I shouldn't have anything on your screen. I'm so, it's amazing. Alan, you're sharing your screen. How did I share my screen with all of you? <laughs> no, but you did. <laughs> Magic. What is the meeting I, password? I clicked at the top where it says types of genetic testing, and your slide deck came up. 
There was a tab for Alan Rosenberg and one for Meeting Info and Quick Start. I hope my message has gone away. <laughs> it has. It wasn't too scandalous. I wasn't saying uh, <laughs> It was it's public information that I'm president of Anthem UF Services. Uh, I was just afraid you were going to go further. I I was going to make a smart remark to uh, Beth, who since the center wanted to know who it was, that it was okay. But I'd tell them I only charge ten thousand an hour for consulting fees. But oh no, that's Accenture who charges that. <laughs> uh, I was kidding. Okay. So now I have control again. Yes. All what right. is the meeting password? Genetic. All right. So chromosome testing or just looking at chromosomes, another name for it is karyotype. And as you can see here, this is the result of a karyotype. And normally chromosomes come in pairs. So typically people have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, chromosomes uh, are typically shown this way from largest to smallest with the sex chromosomes uh, over separately. Chromosome abnormalities can include having an extra chromosome like this extra chromosome 21 here, which produces a genetic imbalance of the genes on that chromosome and produces uh, Down syndrome. What you're probably unfamiliar with is how chromosome tests are done. And what happens is Blood is drawn, and it's typically in a anticoagulant, usually heparin, and then the blood is cultured with phytohemagglutinin, and they are stimulated and cultured, typically for three days, although they can be done for a little bit shorter than that. They then add colchicine and hypotonic saline, and this then enables them to spread out the cells on the slide. They then digest the chromosome, so they remove a lot of proteins, and then they stain it, and they look at it under the microscope, and then take the visual image and sort out the chromosomes to make that neat karyotype. So this is labor-intensive and takes uh, time. And typically, we use karyotypes to diagnose the conditions such as Down syndrome, and uh, even though you may feel confident the child has Down syndrome looking at them as a geneticist, you still would do a karyotype first to confirm that indeed the child has Down syndrome, but secondly to determine if it's due to what we call trisomy, where there's three separate chromosomes, or whether it's due to what's called a translocation producing trisomy, in which case there's up to 50% risk that it's inherited from a parent who has rearrangement of their chromosomes, so it's called a balanced translocation. This would impact the recurrence risk. So karyotype can detect whether there are too many or too few chromosomes, whether it's a missing part of a chromosome, which means they then have only one copy of the genes for that region of the chromosome. Simply duplications, in which case you would have extra copies of genes. And then translocations, which I just mentioned, you have pieces of chromosomes that are broken and reattached to each other. Excuse okay. me, Dr. Flannery, can people yep. remember to put their phone on mute, please? We're getting some background noise. Thank you very much. Karyotyping has its limits because many deletions or duplications that are clinically significant are not visible, uh, even under the microscope, and we commonly call those micro-deletions or micro-duplications. And we can detect these by using what's called a FISH test, which stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. And what a FISH test involves is taking a probe, which is single-stranded DNA, that has fluorescent molecules attached to it, and depending on what chromosome and what region of a chromosome you're trying to look at with the FISH probe, it would match up with a particular code of genes in that region. And as you can see here, it's applied to the chromosome, and it attaches where the you know, complementary region is. Now what can happen is, 
as we see in the next slide, if we can get there. Uh, there are some conditions, such as one called DeGeorge syndrome, in which what happens is you have, using this probe specific to the DeGeorge critical region, you see that in one chromosome 22, that region is present because the probe could attach. In this other 22, it could not attach because that region is missing. So there is an invisible to the naked eye and even to the microscope, micro deletion in that region of that chromosome, but the FISH test demonstrates that that region is missing. And uh, there are other micro deletion syndromes, and one more common one is Prader Willi in our Angelman syndrome. We'll talk about that you know, subsequently. And then there are duplications that can be detected. Uh, in one form of Charcot-Marie tooth disease, they actually can use the DNA probe here for this region of this gene, and they look for duplications or extra copies of the genetic material there, which confirms that form of Charcot-Marie tooth. Uh, a very rare disease that you've probably never heard of, and I'm probably mispronouncing because I've never seen a case called Pelesia Smertzbacher. Uh, there's a duplication of a particular uh, region. Now, another use of FISH is for rapid diagnosis of trisomies. And for example, if we have a newborn in a neonatal intensive care unit who has severe congenital heart disease and physical uh, abnormalities, one might be concerned that the child may have a condition called trisomy 18. And trisomy 18 is very severe. Uh, the chance of survival to age one is very small, uh, despite aggressive medical care. And cardiac surgery in this setting would be potentially very uh, risky for that child. A karyotype takes 72 hours, but using interphase fish, where they take the cells and they deposit onto them these fish probes, they can sit there and look and detect, in this case here, that there are three signals for chromosome 18 in these white blood cells confirming that the child indeed does have trisomy 18. This test takes a few hours to get results rather than days, so it can be extremely useful in this setting and help uh, parents and physicians uh, have informed discussions and make uh, decisions. So now we're going to move on and talk about the, the patient who needs genetic testing, we'll talk about uh, how we make decisions about testing and then what tests would be indicated. So we have a hypothetical patient, a boy who has microcephaly, hyperactivity, seizures, developmental delay, verbal apraxia, which typically is manifested that they have a very limited vocabulary, say five, six, seven, eight words total, and a very happy affect in this patient. So the doctor's concerned the child may have, have Angelman syndrome. Now, we know that 68% or so of cases have a microdeletion of a region of chromosome 15. So the first logical step in evaluating this child for Angelman syndrome would be to order a FISH test with a specific DNA probe that detects this region of chromosome 15. And so here, the test has been done and the result is that no deletion was detected in the Angelman syndrome critical region. And the next step is, well, we're still concerned as Angelman syndrome. We don't know how to manage this patient. So we go and we just look in 11% of cases are caused by mutation in the UBE3A gene. 7% have uniparental disomy. Three have what's called an imprinting center defect, and then a smaller number have uh, other abnormalities. So logically, the next step would be to do the UBE3A gene sequencing. And this is probably a little sch schematic for you, but this is explaining the process of how they do uh, gene sequencing. And it's become automated in machines now where they can put in the DNA after amplifying the region of the uh, genome that is targeted for the testing. And then the machine basically goes through and is breaking up the gene and looking at uh, what the pieces of the gene are. And it then generates a diagram like this, which is showing you <coughs> what the code is going along a segment of the gene. 
And here we have results of sequencing the UBE3A gene in a patient who has an abnormality uh, in the UBE3 gene. It's showing that the patient has a change <coughs> at this point in the gene, which is not the normal base that should be in that region, so therefore it's a mutation that is causing the problem. Now, sequencing results can be complicated because um, there can be changes in the gene and you have to determine whether they cause a problem or not. Uh, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the Association for Molecular Pathology put out a joint policy statement this year establishing standards and guidelines for the interpretation of what we call sequence variants because a change in the code could simply be a variant or it could be causing a problem. And so we established standards for how you would interpret whether a change is what we call pathogenic, which means we feel confident that it causes the gene to malfunction. Likely pathogenic, which means it most likely does cause malfunction. Benign, which means a change in the gene produces no effect on how the gene functions, or likely benign. And then, of course, unfortunately at times, it's of uncertain significance. And for the for the physician and the family, and I'm sure for the payer, getting to that point, the result comes back of uncertain significance uh, can be a bit of a challenge. Now, sometimes we'll have a false negative test result. So you do the test, you don't find a change in the gene. Well, the patient may have uh, a change in the gene that you tested, but there's another gene that's also responsible for producing what we call the same phenotype, which is the abnormalities in uh, the body or behavior or combination of those two. Um, they could have a sequence change that cannot be detected by sequence analysis, which includes what we call a large deletion. And Frequently, if you know a gene <coughs> is prone to have deletions, uh, when you do a sequencing test, you may then, if it's negative, uh, reflex to doing uh, a fish probe for uh, looking for deletion. And then sometimes the test would be negative when the patient has a sequence change in a region of the gene that's not covered by the test, because not all regions of all genes are uh, adequately uh, sequenced and covered, um, and this especially applies to whole uh, genome and whole exome sequencing, which will be, a, I think, a topic of two more two talks later. So now another useful test is what we call a chromosome microarray test, and I know you all have heard about this. Uh, typically, it's called a gene chip that uses comparative genomic hybridization to look missing regions or extra segments of regions of chromosomes. And the easy way to think about it is that it's performing thousands of fish tests simultaneously, and I'll show you. So this is from um, a now defunct laboratory called Signature Genomics, uh, but it was in their educational material that they had. And so basically what they do is using um, the same kind of microprocessing technology that they use to make a silicon you know, computer chip, they can actually put tiny pieces of gene sequences onto one of these silicon um, chips or glass chips. And you can then know which one are there. And so what they do is they put probes that are attached to this chip that are unique segments of every chromosome. And so depending on the number of probes, it can represent every genetic region of the entire genome. And that's pretty much what chromosome microarrays are like currently. So here's the, the chip, here's the probes attached to the chip. You then take the patient's DNA and you take it so that you heat it so that the DNA separates from being double-stranded and to be single-stranded. And then these pieces are put into the machine in the chip and they all sort of up and pair up with their areas that they match up to. <coughs> And so here, though, you have a case where the patient's DNA doesn't attach to this probe. And so there's not a match for that area. And they have now 
computer processing that analyzes the entire chip, and it comes up and it gives you um, <clears throat> a report that tells you if you've got duplicated genomic material from a particular region or multiple regions or a deleted genomic region. And sometimes you'll find multiple deletions or duplications simultaneously, although that's not as common. Now, the microarray can tell you if there's a duplication or deletion, but it can't tell you if it's been caused by a rearrangement of a chromosome. So sometimes having done a chromosome microarray then leads to the need to do the old-fashioned chromosome test, which is sort of counterintuitive, I'm sure, to many people, but uh, it can be a necessary next step in evaluation. Microarray results uh, make 10 to 15 percent more diagnoses and karyotyping in the evaluation of patients with idiopathic learning disabilities. Uh, some microarrays have been reported as having as high as 28 percent rate of diagnosis. And um, ACMG put out a practice guideline in 2010 affirming the use of chromosome microarray as a first-tier genetic test in evaluating patients with intellectual disability and or multiple congenital anomalies. And just recently, the European Journal of Human Genetics uh, published a report talking about the clinical utility of genomic testing and particularly looking at what subsequent medical recommendations uh, came about in patients after they had a microarray test done that showed an abnormality. And in some instances, this would have to do with management of the patient, such as uh, doing further testing, knowing there's a high incidence, say, of seizures, and having the patient evaluated for that, or that the child may have an increased risk of developing cancer down the line, so sort of surveillance for whatever type of tumor that might be would be indicated, and uh, other sorts of uh, investigations that would be indicated. Now, just like with doing sequencing of genes, a microarray test may tell come with a result that they say is normal, or say it's you know, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, likely benign, a variant of unknown significance. And when you have a variant of unknown significance, the lab frequently recommends testing the parents to see if either of them has the same change in the gene. Because if either parent has the same change in the gene and that parent is healthy and normal, then that change is not pathogenic. Conversely, if the parents were tested and neither has that same change, it's not possible to say for sure whether the change in the child is causing the child's problems, although you would be suspicious of that. Now, someone had asked about SNPs, and so we decided to talk about what's called SNP arrays. And they are microarrays that have what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms in them. And what a single nucleotide polymorphism is a variation of a single base pair in the DNA sequence uh, from the typical. And so here's a picture uh, diagram of what a SNP is. So here, at this one location in this gene sequence, this individual has this sequence at that point, and this individual has this, G, this base. SNPs do not necessarily change the function of a gene, and typically they don't. That's why they're called single nucleotide polymorphisms, because a polymorphism doesn't have functional effects. Um, as of the last time I checked, SNP arrays uh, have 1.8 million probes for SNPs, and they have different ones they use. And if the test in the individual is tested has a specific SNP in a specific gene, that's called a positive result. It can also detect small deletions or duplications. But what's really interesting is doing the SNP arrays can yield surprising information beyond that. It's called loss of what we call heterozygosity. And so it was first called to Genesis' attention in an article in Lancet in 2011, uh, which called attention to the fact that they could identify incestuous uh, paternal relationship by SNP array. And what they found in this article 
was that these green regions of these various chromosomes had two copies of the same rare SNP. And the, this degree of what we call homozygosity uh, is uh, best explained by the parents being related to each other and passing down SNPs that uh, they carried by uh, being related to each other. And this actually does come up. We had an internationally adopted girl who had mental retardation, uh, nonspecific abnormal facial appearance, and since she had been adopted internationally, there's no family or prenatal history available, and her parents um, had to been trying to find what was the cause for a problem to figure out what could be done for her more specifically. And she had had all these tests done before she came to see us. And so SNP arrays were available, and we said, well, you know, let's take a look at this. Well, this girl had a very high degree of uh, homozygosity of regions of her chromosomes. <clears throat> it corresponded to the biologic parents being very closely related, like closer than first cousins. And so it led us to be concerned that she might have some sort of autosomal recessive disorder because she could have received two co identical copies of an abnormal gene from her related parents, but we didn't have a clue uh, as to what that might have been. And that was back in 2000 and 12. Uh, here we have a, uh, another patient we saw back in Georgia. And this girl had a very complex phenotype with mental retardation, nonspecific dysmorphism, so she was you know, unusual looking, but not characteristic of any particular appearance. She had multiple congenital anomalies, and she had endocrine dysfunction. And so we did a SNP array on her. And one of the regions with homozygosity was the, had contained the gene for Bardet Beetle syndrome, type 7. And she had features compatible with this condition, but she lacked most, many of the characteristic features. And so what we decided to do was go and uh, try to get sequencing for that specific gene done on her. Uh, unfortunately, she had uh, managed care Medicaid and it, uh, did not get approved, and I'm not sure what's happened with her since that time. All right. Now we're going to talk about another patient situation, a three-year-old boy who's not walking and has only a few word vocabulary. His growth is normal. He has a long facial profile. Family history is not significant. And so what would be the first test to evaluate him? Well, as I mentioned, you know, ACMG uh, practice guideline had recommended chromosome microarray in this setting as the first tier test. So, of course, that was done and is normal. So you go, what's next? I mean, what test do you order? There has to be some logic to this. Well, the most common cause of intellectual disability in males is something called Fragile X syndrome. So the physician sends blood for Fragile X testing. And this comes back and showed, oh gosh, I kept something out of sequence. Anyway, it was expansion of the fragile X gene. And this is showing that it's what we call a CGG repeat. And uh, Dr. Jack Tarleton gave me these slides. It shows you that normally people have 29 or 30 of these three base pair repeats in that gene. <laughs> when you have significantly increased number of repeats, you end up with dysfunction of the gene, which produces them we call the fragile X syndrome. And this is showing another way they do it, which what they used to call southern blot testing, and it actually was a more tedious process than the previous one they were showing, what we call PCR testing, um, and it actually used... Uh, uh, radioactive labeling to be able to show uh, where the region that you're concerned about is, and the size of this corresponds to the number of repeats. So our patient had 330 repeats and so had Fragile X. Uh, the mom needed to be tested because the risk of having another affected male increases depending on how many repeats she has. So 
depending on the number of repeats that the mom is found to have, affects whether or not there's a greater than 50% risk of another male uh, having this condition or a lower risk of it happening. Uh, in addition, women who have expansions of the uh, gene uh, are at increased risk of developing premature ovarian failure <coughs> and should be monitored for that. And then it was most interesting about this and something that we only learned over time <coughs> is that her father should be offered testing. I put should be tested, but he should be offered testing because he could have what we call a pre-mutation expansion of that gene, which places him at risk for developing what's called fragile X-associated tremor ataxia syndrome as he gets older. And <coughs> knowing that he has that um, would certainly make it much easier for neurologists to uh, diagnose why he's developing a tremor rather than start worrying about doing all kinds of tests for all kinds of other potential neurologic disorders to produce tremors. There are many other trinucleotide repeat disorders. Uh, you've all heard of Huntington disease. Uh, there are a whole host of spinocerebellar ataxias that have trinucleotide repeats. And there's a condition called myotonic dystrophy which uh, is produced by trinucleotide repeats. And we've reached the end there. I think we've given people enough time for questions as well. Great. Dr. Flannery, thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Um, at this time, I'd like to see if there are any questions from anyone on the line for Dr. Flannery. Well, Dr. Flannery, I um, have um, a question for you uh, while we're waiting to see if anyone else uh, from the audience has, has a question. I'm wondering if you could um, address that if the types of mutations that are detected by FISH can also be detected by CMA, why would you choose one type of testing over the other? Right. Well, in the case, say, for Angelman syndrome, um, if you, you know, the patient's phenotype is such that you feel very concerned that it's Angelman syndrome, uh, doing a uh, FISH test would be you know, probably you know less expensive uh, than doing a chromosome microarray test. Uh, you're correct; a microarray would be able to detect that region. Uh, at least most microarrays would have probes for that region. But um, you know, that's you know, it depends on how confident the uh, physician is. You know, a pediatrician who's concerned about the child might very well do the chromosome microarray, whereas an experienced uh, medical geneticist would see the patient and, you know, be concerned specifically about Angelman syndrome and then be, you know, doing that test. Um, you know, it, it has to do with um, the people uh, seeing the patient and their experience. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I have another question, but I'm going to if uh, th there are others out there with a question first. And so, like, our, with our webinars, people type in questions, but I don't see where you have that here. Yeah, this is this is Dr. John Goldenring, uh, Pediatric Medical Director out in California. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd review a little bit more for us about the um, utility of, of the microarray testing, and particularly if you'd address the issue of kids who have autism. Um, what is the clinical utility mm -hmm. of finding micro deletions in kids who have autism? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you want me to talk about the clinical utility? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. you, 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 you showed that article, which I'll go get for, from sure. uh, Europe, right. which goes over a lot of stuff. But I want, want to focus particularly on the autism thing. I think we right. see... The largest number of microarrays may, requests may be coming from all these kids right. in our epidemic of autism. And I, as a pediatrician, haven't found any good literature that says this is clinically uh, useful at this time. 
and I will qualify my statement because there may be something that we discover over time. But at this time, we don't know what that means. Right. Why would you do this? Right. There, there are other articles besides that one from Europe uh, about um, changes in, in uh, management of patients after chromosome microarray testing, including after doing them for children with autism. Um, and it has to do with what it, region is found to be abnormal and then what other medical issues could result from that. And uh, most often it would be, you know, there's like an increased risk for having some other medical problems such as renal abnormalities uh, or, you know, some other problem in terms of neurologic uh, function or um, risk of congenital heart disease that was not, you know, necessarily going to be obvious. Um, <clears throat> And now I can I can try to track those down for you, for you and um, you know send them to. Well, you know, uh, I, I think that's that's actually fascinating. Um, if, if indeed we got back reports as pediatricians that said, you know, because this particular area is involved here, we think there's a higher risk of X, and, and that's not something I've seen a lot of, and I right. find that fascinating. And it would be interesting to see if that could be quantified. And yes, I I think many of us would appreciate. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll try to find right. some of the other articles as well. And, um, you know, just my personal experience, I've had the experience of, you know, having a child who, you know, we do the testing and it came back with a uh, micro deletion in a particular region. And among the genes in that region were one that was associated with, um, I forget what type of cancer. And so it's like, what do we do with this? Send them to the pediatric hematologist, oncologist, you know, and they've had to then figure out how you would evaluate the child and monitor them for development of, of that particular tumor. And that was one I, that's one I specifically remember. And then I do remember a patient where uh, in that region that was involved in the child that there was, you know, increased risk of having uh, either, I think it was a, renal malformation or it was renal agenesis and so you know that led to doing ultrasound of the kid's kidneys which were fine but i suppose we found out he only had one kidney that could have some significant implications uh for his life um but i'll be happy to try to find those other articles for you as well it's just it was just fortuitous that one from europe happened to just pop up in my uh my email when i was working on putting this talk together <clears throat> and it was like hot off the press so i figured that was a good one Thank you. That would be helpful. And by the way, a superb summary talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Flannery, a, a follow-up, I, th I think, to the last question on, and that your, the article from Europe that you referenced about, um, I think, the, the percentage of patients tested who had a positive finding. Um, I, I th the, the question I have is, who who exactly is be was being tested in that study? I mean, I mean, it, is it is it anyone with any sort of intellectual uh, delay, or is it particular types of intellectual delays coupled with perhaps other phenotypes, uh, other other findings? Uh, this is being recorded, of course. And here I am scrolling back through the slides. It's probably going to cause somebody to have a seizure going this fast. Um, it's fine. Um, I can't read this. 752 children with congenital anomalies and or developmental delay who underwent chromosome microarray testing. Uh, so that, that was their target group there. That was, it doesn't mention autism in that group there, but right. children who had congenital anomalies um, and uh, or developmental delay. And typically, you know, my recommendation, you know, is if a child just has autism and doesn't have developmental delay, you know, I, I think it's unlikely that a microarray is going to identify much of anything, to be honest with you. Um, that's just my personal opinion. That's not the opinion of the American College of Medical Genetics, nor, um, <clears throat> you know, necessarily everybody's opinion. Dr. Flannery, this is Megan McCarville. I'm with the association. I am, it was a very nice presentation. I wish I'd had this like two years ago when I'd started trying to write policies about 
microarrays, but I'm curious about how much, um, you know, practitioners need to consider differences in the composition of micro uh, of the microwaves. Like my understanding is that uh, you know what you yeah. test for is dependent on what it's looking for, but I don't have a good sense for right. how you know or how you know right. how the um, year or how a practitioner would know what yeah. what you need to be looking for. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what you're bringing up is that some labs, you know, have their own particular microarray. And they have their own particular probes that they use in their microarray, and you know it can differ from you know lab to lab. I know that uh, ACMG has technical guidelines for laboratories and has like standards for this, and um, that hopefully is becoming more adopted across things. But in many instances, um, you know. These are something that's not it's sort of more like what we call an LDT sort of uh, test, you know, laboratory developed test as opposed to um, a standard thing that's purchased. Although I think it's probably going towards becoming more standardized uh, as things go along. Uh, but certainly, there I know there are labs that have their own particular, you know, microarray that they have adapt adopted and used. And um, in some instances, it, you know, I guess they consider it to be a proprietary, unique product that they've chosen certain genetic regions, and the depth of coverage of certain genetic regions is being, um, you know, more important. Um, at one point in time, I think there was like sharing of data among labs, and I'm not sure what the status of that is, you know, for them to help uh, interpret, you know, what becomes useful and what isn't, and then also to help uh, people learn, you know, what might not be a variant of unknown significance anymore. You know, they help them determine that it's, you know, not pathogenic or it is pathogenic. Um, and I'm not sure what's happened to that. I was think it was Dr. David Ledbetter who was involved with that, um, and was driving that sort of uh, process, but I'm not sure what's happened since he moved to another institution. Um, but you're correct, um, and it would be, you know, by now I think is getting more standardized, but I know there still are proprietary microarrays out there. Um, I'm not going to say who I think has the best microarray, <laughs> but but I would, you know, think that um, if they're, you know, at least adopting the technical standards that uh, ACMG's you know, expert review and evidence-based review process you know, recommended is sort of what the critical elements for a microarray should include, uh, then that should be, you know, you know pretty uh, reliable and appropriate to, to use. Great, thank you. This is Alan Rosenberg. And, uh, Dr. Flannery, thanks a lot for the presentation, as the others have said. I um, lead medical policy for uh, Anthem and its plans, including Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is an extension of the clinical utility question mm -hmm. that was asked uh, earlier. But it's to the asymptomatic individual, because one of the cases you cited is an individual where you recommended it might prevent the future workup uh, if the uh, if as the father uh, um, or grandfather rather right. aged, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, developed an ataxia syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is why in the asymptomatic individual would you do that rather than simply share that possibility and wait to see if they develop an ataxia syndrome and do the testing at that time? Mm -hmm. in terms of clinical utility. Well, as I, as I phrased it, the slide I didn't put in with how we would do it as a practitioner or a clinical geneticist, you would, you know, discuss it with the grandfather and say, you know, you know, we know that your daughter has been tested and she has an expansion of this gene. It's uh, very likely that she inherited that from you um, and um, 
you know, there is a there are problems that can result from you having expansion of this gene and explain what the fragile X uh, associated uh, tremor ataxia syndrome is and the typical, you know, signs and symptoms of onset and you know, we we never just tell people they should have tests, you know, we we explain to them what the benefits might be, what the uh, you know, pros and cons might be and what people make decisions. And so in that setting the grandfather might say, Right, I certainly wanna know, you know, uh, you know, who knows? You know. But he might say, No, I don't wanna know. Let's you know and uh you know, they make their decision. Now the benefit to to him of knowing that he has an expansion that places him at risk for developing fragile X associated uh tremor ataxia syndrome um is not going to come today, tomorrow, you know, next year. <laughs> but as I pointed out, yeah, it potentially can, you know, prevent the so-called uh, diagnostic odyssey that uh, we talked about of people being tested for things and, you know, trying to find the underlying cause of symptoms that are not very specific. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, they, the gentleman in question might say, well, thank you. Uh, so if I ever develop any symptoms, you know, I'll tell the neurologist I have this risk, and then they can do the test then. And we'd say, fine. Sounds like you you understood everything we told you very well. You know, excellent. Just, you know, the, you're you're in charge. You know? no, I appreciate it. I've just been wondering if yeah. uh, right. 50% of people will be tested with a negative on average result and 50% with a positive why you would waste the resources today rather than waiting until that time. Yeah. And even then, I wonder. But I, it's fine. I just was curious about sure. the, the sure. logic tree. And sure. that. There's right. my humanities and contemporary civilization training in Columbia. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, good. And then um, I... I, I Maybe I'll send you also um, a copy of uh, ACMG's um, recently um, published uh, policy, or I think it's position statement regarding looking at clinical utility of genetic testing um, beyond simply, you know, the benefit directly to the patient, which I sort of touched on here. Uh, but you may find that uh, to be uh, to be a useful um, you know, report to look at as well. So I'll send that with along with some other cl papers about clinical utility of chromosome microarray testing. Thank you. Dr. Flannery, we certainly would appreciate that, and we'll ensure that uh, all of the participants on today's webinar are able to uh, get access to those materials. Great. Are there any other questions uh, before we say a final thank you to Dr. Flannery today? Great. Well, well David, we really much. do appreciate it. I thank you very much. Uh, to everyone on the phone, our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, October 13th. Uh, and on that webinar, we will focus on understanding CPT coding of genetic tests. So we all hope that you can join us then. Thank you very much, and have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.